Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, if you are ready, we are ready to start. Ladies and gentlemen, may I ask you to take your seats? Dear European Chief Prosecutor, dear Prosecutor Generals, very distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to open the second day of our conference on the European Public Prosecutor's Office. One year in action towards resolving complexity and bringing added value. Today we celebrate the first anniversary of taking operations of the European Public Prosecutor's Office. It's a great pleasure to have you here today. I will not use much of the time um, and I will leave the floor to the very distinguished speakers um, of this morning. I would just like to give some uh, technical remarks before we launch the conference day of today. <coughs> First, we shall listen to the keynote speech of Commissioner for Justice Didier Reitnaus. He could not be with us today in person. He is, I believe, in Washington today, but he sent us a video message. So in a minute, you will see his video message. And then I will give the floor to Ms. Korduta Kövesi, the European Chief Prosecutor. I don't believe that I need to introduce her to you. She is the former Chief Prosecutor of Romania's National Anti-Corruption Directorate, the DNA in Romania. It's a position she held from 2013 until July 2018. Prior to this, she was the Prosecutor General of Romania, attached to the High uh, Court of Cassation and Justice. She was the first woman and the youngest Prosecutor General in Romania's history. Without Further ado, I will leave the floor to the video message. Just one technical note. This morning, uh, we will have the conference in two languages, French and English. We provide for simultaneous translation. You have uh, the necessary uh, headsets in your table, and you can use channel one for French. Thank you very much, and now please listen to the message of Commissioner Reitnaus. Dear Laura Kervashi, I would like to congratulate you, as well as each European prosecutor, each delegated prosecutor, and each member of the EPPO staff for your remarkable work over this year. Amazing results in such a short time. We'll hear more about this from Madame Kervashi herself, no doubt. But I can tell you that the EPPO is plugging a hole in the European Union's budget. Between June and December last year, 576 investigations revealed an estimate 5.4 billion euro had leaked from the EU budget. You are helping to get this money back, and you are doing this under difficult circumstances. When you took up your post at the EPPO, the European Union has adopted a long-term budget and a recovery instrument, Next Generation EU. This is the largest stimulus package ever financed in Europe. Because we are rebuilding after a major crisis, and we need every euro possible to do this. The work of the EPPO to ensure no single euro is lost to fraud is more crucial than we could have ever imagined. Today, we are faced with another crisis, this time in Ukraine. 
We are providing humanitarian aid and helping the Ukrainian government cover basic expenses, for example. Again, we cannot afford for money to be stolen by fraudsters. So I'm happy that the EPPO and the Prosecutor General's Office of Ukraine, Ina Venediktova, are going to work together to prevent this. After this first year, and now you are all settling into the job, we need to ask what lies ahead and how we can do even better. I can tell you firstly that I will remain your most loyal supporter. I can also see three areas where I think the European Commission can help even more in full respect of the PPO's independence. First, I want to ensure the PPO can do its job to the best of its abilities according to EU law. This means that countries who are members of the PPO have to apply the rules properly. A month ago, the Commission launched a study to analyze national legislation to see whether this is the case. Normally, we would do this after a few years of a new regulation entering into force. Here, we start working on it after just one year, because it is so important we get things right. In the meantime, if there are any discrepancies, we will inform member states and follow up accordingly, including by means of infringement proceedings if necessary. The Commission also expects member states that do not participate in the PPO to cooperate with it. Not recognizing the PPO as a competent authority and refusing its request for assistance is not a good start and may even breach the principle of sincere cooperation. Eventually, we also want them to consider joining. We will also look at whether the rules of the regulation itself are fit for the PPO's purposes. In case of difficulties, we will see how to address them if necessary and in what time frame. Secondly, it is clear there is a need for more cooperation and evidence exchanges in cross-border cases involving third countries. This includes countries where the financial and banking system is attractive to fraudsters and where there is clearly a need to cooperate. I want the Commission to help EPPO to do this by helping find the right channel of communication. Thirdly, after the evaluation of EPPO activities, it will be time next year to reflect if EPPO could do more and maybe which new competences it could explore. So, Happy birthday for this first year. I cannot be with you today, but I will come to meet all of you next week on the 9th of June in Luxembourg. Thank you very much. See you soon. Good morning to all of you. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank the University of Luxembourg for organizing this landmark conference on the first anniversary of the European Public Prosecutor's Office. It could be the beginning of a tradition, a gathering of experts, officials, and academics with practitioners to take stock of what we have achieved of the challenges addressed and to discuss possible ways forward. There is a lot of think, there is a lot of to think about, to imagine, to propose. I'm grateful for dear Catalin Legetti's initiative and sense of anticipation. How could the University of Luxembourg not become EPPO's alma mater? A year ago, 
only one year ago. The expression time flies does not accurately depict what we have been through at the EPPO since 1st June 2021, unless time flies means flying at supersonic speed. Allow me to give you the latest key figures. We have registered and analyzed more than 4,000 crime reports. We have opened 929 investigations. We have been granted the seizure of more than 259 million euro of assets. We have already filled 28 indictments and obtained four definitive convictions. These figures are in the line with what we have anticipated. Our workload estimates were correct and our budgetary resources fully justified. Some of you might remember that the initial plan was that we would start operations with 24 staff members in Luxembourg and 32 and a quarter European delegated prosecutors. It is true that at the time there was limited visibility as to the volume of ongoing criminal investigations into EU fraud in the member states. Still, I could not imagine starting the EPPO with fewer resources than a local prosecution office in Romania. And yet, people with a limited understanding of what a prosecution office does, does and how it works kept telling me that this is what the usual way to proceed in the EU. We were supposed to start small and slowly reach cruising speed. And there I was explaining to them that due to the mandatory nature of our competence, to start small roughly corresponds to what they had foreseen for us at cruising speed. And that this is the bare minimum. And then it, it, it hit me. There is a serious and whispered misconception about the APPO, unfortunately wrote it in our funding regulation. The European Public Prosecutor Office is not an EU agency. We do not execute or coordinate a policy defined by a political authority. We are not a network, we are not a new layer to improve cross-border cooperation in judicial matters. Rather, we are the result of a transfer of sovereignty from the participating member states. We are the first transnational prosecution office, an independent organ of the European judiciary. The main reason I insist that the initial proposing of the EPPO in the EU institutional landscape is wrong is not because it makes our lives too complicated in many practical aspects of our operations. The main reason is that our present positioning is not consistent with what the legislator wants us to be a truly independent prosecution office, and we have to correct this. In the course of this conference, you have had many opportunities with my colleagues to go into the details of numerous challenges that we have faced so far. You are making the case that, in particular, those difficulties deriving from our legal environment be it at EU or national level, need to be addressed without delay. Today, I would like to give you my assessment of what we have already achieved, as well as an insight into what we want the EPPO to become. We have already achieved two important objectives. We have effectively increased the level of protection of the EU budget, and we have demonstrated our decisive advantage in cross-border investigations. So far, 
the level of protection of the financial interest of the EU has varied across the member states. In some member states, hundreds of investigations has been, have been conducted, while in the others, there were only two or even fewer cases per year. Limited to crimes against the EU budget, our specialization means that there are now in all the participating member states prosecutors with the same priority. This alone is already increasing the overall level of protection of the EU budget. I am confident that you will already see a clear improvement translated into numbers in our second annual report next year. With the establishment of the EPPO, we have created what I call the EPPO zone, a zone where by implementing a prosecutorial policy, we are unifying the approach to EU fraud investigations, a zone in which we act as a single office with a specific working regime outside the usual channels of judicial cooperation. It is not only about having the same objective, a short set of tools and simplified procedures. In the EPP on zone, we think and act functionally rather than internationally. We no longer think, for example, in terms of a case initiated in Germany to which we associate relevant national authorities in Italy and Bulgaria. We think in terms of a strike against a particular criminal organization via EPPO offices in Munich, Milan, and Sofia. By doing so, we are, we are changing the paradigm of cross-border investigations in the EU. Take a recent example, Operation Platinum Rush. In July 2019, German authorities started an investigation into a VAT fraud scheme. In Germany, for this kind of fraud, the expectation is to obtain first convictions on average within three years of the start of investigation. When the EPPO took over this case in June 2021, it enlarged the scope of the investigation to three other member states. We identified new suspects and assets. In November 2021, we made the first arrests and seized 3 million euro worth of assets. Five months later, we have a list of 30 suspects as well as four definitive convictions and confiscations. As you can see, we have been a spectacular accelerator. More importantly, we are the only ones in a position to wipe out the entire organized crime group that we have discovered behind this scheme. There is no doubt that the EPPO brings huge efficiency gains. Not only are we faster when it comes to individual cases, we are also in a position to discover new criminal activities and open new investigations based on information that no one else has access to. No one is currently better placed than the EPPO to investigate all the possible ramifications of a cross-border case. Our immediate access to all the information in the cases registered in the participating member states allows us to establish connections and to find assets that could otherwise not be identified. As we speak, we are working on several highly complex cases with the damages in the hundreds of millions of euro for each of them. These cases would never exist as such were it not for the EPPO. There will be an administrative investigation here, a criminal investigation into a little part of the criminal organization involved there, but it is us, European prosecutors and EPPO central office support staff who connected the dots and unveiled all together different pictures 
of what is going on. Trust me, I cannot wait for the moment when we will be able to communicate these cases to the public. In the meantime, I'm happy that in several instances, prosecutors generals have already recognized the groundbreaking potential of the EPPO and have agreed to entrust us with investigations which, under the EPPO regulation, could be kept at national level. Which brings me to what we want the EPPO to become. Our prosecutorial policy is to focus on cases involving serious organized crime, and our main objective is to help the member states recover the damages. When you look at our competence, in particular when it comes to cross-border VAT fraud, it is evident that our main adversaries are organized criminal groups. The gap between what the tax authorities in the EU should collect and what they actually collect can be roughly estimated at 130 billion euro. How much of that is the result of fraud? Probably between 30 and 60 billion euro. Every year, year after year, for decades. Do we really understand the implications of the existence of criminal organizations capable of inflicting sank damages with VAT fraud alone? Even if we put aside the prosecutorial point of view or any consideration for security and justice, this money should either have been paid into the budgets of the member states or it has been simply stolen from them. If I were a finance minister, I would be losing sleep over it, especially in the current economic context when inflation is high, particularly for essential goods. But it is not only about these cases. I was in Slovakia recently and met the parents of journalist Jan Kuciak. When he was murdered, he was about to publish an article about Drangheta's use of EU agricultural funds to launder money. This scheme had been going on for years. Difficult to say whether it was undetected or not properly investigated. One thing is certain, however, mutual legal assistance was a total failure in this case. It was only once the article was published and due to the tragic circumstances surrounding its publication, its contents known to the whole world that the national authorities accelerated their cooperation. The painful yet unavoidable question here is how we can keep pretending that the system of fraud prevention and control of EU funds is working well, considering what Jan Kuciak disclosed. Ladies and gentlemen, last, just like Daphne Caruana Galizia, Jan Kuciak was an investigative journalist. He was detecting economic and financial crime and corruption. And he was killed because he was so good at it. It all starts with detection. If there is no detection, there cannot be investigation, no prosecution, no judgment not recovery of damages. Journalists can do a great job in this respect, but it's not their primary responsibility. Our main finding based on one year of operations is that we need to increase the level of detection of EU fraud, be it in the member states or in the different institutions, bodies, agencies, and organizations at EU. This is why I started discussions with the Director General of OLAF, Mr. Ville Itala, exploring the possibility of OLAF investigators endorsing a more prominent role with regard to the detection of fraud of both ends of the EU budget, expenses and revenues, in particular custom frauds. 
This is why I have also initiated a dialogue with the National Chief of Police, Tax Administrations and Customs, as well as the responsible ministers. I will keep insisting on the advantage of setting up dedicated specialized units to support EPPO investigations, combining financial, tax and customs investigators. It is a well-proven best practice. Concretely, I propose we constitute an elite corps of highly qualified financial fraud investigators within the EU working transnationally via the EPPO. In most member states, it requires a more organizational decision by the relevant national authorities. It can be done tomorrow. All we need is political will. Ladies and gentlemen, to conclude, there is no precedent for the EPPO to follow. It is not only that we are creating a new European institution. We are creating the first transnational prosecution office. The creation of the EPPO has a deeply restructuring effect. Our activity triggers readjustments, reorganizations, and recalibrations, both at EU and national level. I also believe that the EPPO will have a positive international impact, particularly once we have established ways of cooperating with key third countries. Beyond all the difficulties that this might entail, we should always keep in mind the potential of the EPPO. While protecting the financial interest of the European Union by means of criminal law, our ambition is to become the best tool available to go after organized crime groups and white-collar criminals. 30 years ago, Italian magistrate Giovanni Falcone was assassinated. I visited Palermo several times, paid my respects to Italian investigative judges, prosecutors, and police officers who gave their lives combating organized crime. We should all remember what happens when criminal organizations rule, a world in which criminals subvert legitimate authorities. It's a world of violence. And our job is to prevent that. Between 2017, when the EPPO regulation was adopted, and today, the overall volume of the financial interest of the EU almost doubled. The COVID pandemic has weakened our economies and made them more vulnerable to criminal infiltration. The risk of corruption has increased. We are only at the beginning, not because member states might decide to join or because some member states are already considering to extend our competence. It is only the beginning for the EPPO because we are changing the paradigm of cross-border investigations involving organized crime and financial fraud in the EU. This is why the establishment of the European Public Prosecutor Office is of strategic importance for European integration and its success a matter of credibility for the European Union. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Kolashi, for this wonderful uh, introductory speech uh, this morning. I believe the key message, uh, one of the key messages, if I may put it that way, is very clear. Detection rates of EU fraud should improve. This is also the topic of the panel which will follow. But before that, we shall listen to the address of the French uh, presidency of the EU. And let me introduce you, Olivier Christen. Uh, Monsieur Christen est directeur des affaires criminelles et des grâces. Il a débuté sa carrière de magistrat en qualité de juge d'instruction au tribunal de grandes instances de Pontoise. En 2002, il a nommé une première fois à la direction des affaires criminelles et des grâces, la position qu'il 
occupe aujourd'hui, mais entre-temps, euh, il a euh, occupé plusieurs fonctions dans la justice euh, française. Vice-président chargé de l'instruction, après il a été nommé vice-procureur de la République auprès de la pa du parquet euh, de Paris, procureur de la République adjoint près de la tribunal grande instance de Paris jusqu'à 2019, avant d'être euh, nommé encore une fois à la direction des affaires criminelles et des grâces. Monsieur Christen, je vous donne la parole. Bien, madame, je vais m'exprimer en, en français. Et, madame la chef du parquet européen, mesdames et messieurs les euh, représentants, euh, procureurs européens, procureurs européens délégués, mesdames et messieurs les hautes personnalités, chers collègues, et, je remercie tout d'abord sincèrement l'université du, euh, du Luxembourg de me donner la parole aujourd'hui au nom de la présidence française du Conseil de l'Union européenne en ce un an, euh, jour pour jour, après l'entrée en fonction opérationnelle du parquet européen. C'est en effet, comme vous le savez, et comme cela a dû être largement discuté, par une décision d'exécution du 25 mai 2021, que la Commission européenne a fixé au 1er juin 2021 la date à laquelle le parquet européen assumerait ses tâches d'enquête et de poursuite. Cet anniversaire est doublement symbolique, euh, d'abord dans l'étape nouvelle qu'il constitue dans la construction de notre espace de liberté, de sécurité et de justice, Ensuite, car cette année aura permis de jeter les bases de fonctionnement du parquet européen et de lancer ses premières enquêtes. Il est symbolique d'abord, disais-je, lorsqu'on se replace dans la chronologie qui a conduit à la création de l'espace de liberté, de sécurité et de justice. Le Conseil européen le tempéré des 15 et 16 octobre 1999 a posé en objectif politique du plus haut niveau de l'espace de liberté, de sécurité et de justice au service des citoyens de l'Union européenne. Deux principes fondamentaux y ont alors été dégagés. Le principe de confiance mutuelle, qui veut que les systèmes judiciaires des États membres sont considérés comme présentant le même niveau de garantie fondamentale de procédure. Et le principe de reconnaissance mutuelle, qui veut que les décisions judiciaires en matière pénale prises dans un État membre sont reconnues et exécutées dans un autre État, dans un autre état membre, comme si elles procédaient une autorité judiciaire de ce second État membre. Deux principes qui forment le socle de la coopération judiciaire, en état, en état, entre États membres de l'Union européenne. Le changement de paradigme qui a été ainsi induit en tentant de dépasser l'incompatibilité ou la complexité des systèmes juridiques et administratifs des États membres pour instaurer un quasi-continuum judiciaire et pénal était un véritable défi dans une matière, le droit pénal, qui est le lieu d'expression privilégié des souverainetés nationales. En un peu plus de 22 ans, Tant a été accompli à la fois en matière d'harmonisation du droit pénal matériel et l'établissement de procédures de nature à fluidifier la coopération judiciaire. L'harmonisation en particulier de minima de seuils maximaux de peine d'emprisonnement encourues et l'établissement de règles minimales en matière de compétences juridictionnelles ou d'outils à destination des enquêteurs ont particulièrement fluidifié l'entraide judiciaire entre États membres. Exécution facilitée d'actes d'enquête dans d'autres États membres remis simplifié des personnes ayant voulu jouer sur les frontières pour se mettre à l'abri des poursuites, et bientôt, je l'espère, obtention rapide de preuves électroniques détenues à l'étranger. Le combat contre les formes graves de criminalité exige de tisser des liens étroits entre nos systèmes juridiques et le développement d'outils procéduraux communs. En bref, davantage de solidarité et d'intégration entre nous. Or, à cet égard, comme vous le releviez tout à l'heure, Madame Covesi, le parquet européen constitue un modèle d'intégration unique. Première autorité judiciaire de l'Union européenne, avec une compétence en matière répressive concurrente à celle des États membres pour rechercher, poursuivre et renvoyer en jugement les auteurs et complices des infractions pénales portant atteinte aux intérêts financiers de l'Union européenne. Le parquet européen définit ainsi la première, la première politique pénale européenne dans le domaine de la protection des intérêts financiers de l'Union européenne. Le parquet européen, nous dit également le règlement qui le constitue, est indivisible. Pour un magistrat français du ministère public français, comme je l'ai été et le redeviendrai peut-être un jour, ce n'est pas simplement un mot. C'est une réalité tangible qui traduit à quel point un parquet est une équipe, un collectif, 
dont chaque membre engage le tout. Le parquet européen a donc bien des procureurs européens délégués, mais ceux-ci, je le pense, se sentent collègues entre eux, peut-être plus qu'avec leurs homologues des parquets nationaux. C'est à mon sens important, car vous êtes les préfigurateurs d'une véritable communauté judiciaire européenne. Avec le parquet européen, on passe de la confiance et de la reconnaissance mutuelle entre les États membres à une autorité de poursuite judiciaire européenne. Qui aurait cru un tel chemin faisable en à peine non pas 22 ans, mais 18 ans si on replace en 2017 la date de l'adoption du règlement constitutif du parquet européen Le mécanisme de délégation de l'article 31 du règlement constitutif marque à cet égard un degré de coopération jamais égalé. Il n'existe pas de procédure de reconnaissance de la mesure déléguée, par exemple une perquisition, qui est purement et simplement exécutée par un autre membre du même parquet européen, le procureur européen délégué assistant, sous réserve bien sûr du besoin d'une éventuelle autorisation judiciaire et du rôle d'arbitrage des chambres permanentes. La confiance réciproque, si essentielle, atteint ici un niveau jamais atteint par le passé. Pour parvenir à un tel résultat, je tiens à souligner l'investissement de long terme du Conseil de l'Union européenne. Les travaux de négociation du règlement constitutif du parquet européen ont été longs, s'étalant sur une durée de près de quatre années et voyant s'opposer des conceptions très différentes de l'organisation du ministère public entre un système hyper centralisé ou, au contraire, un système au plus près des juridictions de jugement ayant à connaître des poursuites diligentées par le parquet européen. Ils ont été techniques naturellement, mais aussi très politiques, puisque je rappelle que c'est dans le cadre de négociations du règlement portant création du parquet européen qu'a eu lieu en octobre 2017 la première procédure de carton jaune dans l'histoire de la JAI. Il aura donc fallu beaucoup de détermination pour aboutir, dans le cas d'une coopération renforcée très large, puisque, dans, seul cas, dans le cas d'une coopération pardon, renforcée très large, puisqu'elle réunit aujourd'hui 22 États membres, ce que vous avez appelé la IPP zone dans le cadre de votre intervention. Naturellement, c'est en ayant à l'esprit cette négociation qu'il faut apprécier par exemple la procédure selon laquelle le parquet européen décide d'exercer ou non sa compétence tout comme les mesures d'enquête disponibles ou encore la recevabilité des modes de preuve. Je le sais, toutes ces dispositions ne suscitent pas toujours l'enthousiasme. Et d'ailleurs, Madame la Procureure, vous avez identifié des marges de progression que vous avez portées à la connaissance des ministres. Ce processus de dialogue entre les praticiens et le législateur est essentiel. Mais comme en droit national, et je le constate assez régulièrement, reste ensuite, lorsque les techniciens, les praticiens ont convenu des évolutions législatives possibles à l'autorité, ont convenu des évolutions, pardon, législatives possibles, à il revient après à l'autorité légitime, au législateur de s'en saisir. C'est déjà très complexe dans un cadre strictement national, cela l'est d'autant plus dans un cadre européen, et c'est là un enjeu permanent. Ceci étant, L'investissement du Conseil de l'Union européenne en faveur du parquet européen n'a jamais cessé et toutes les pistes de réflexion nourrissant ces réflexions sont intéressantes. À ce jour, les experts des différents États membres se réunissent régulièrement à Bruxelles pour assurer la mise en œuvre pleine et efficace du règlement constitutif. Ces dernières semaines, et pour les semaines encore à venir, ont été ou seront abordés des sujets tels que la mise en place du comité de sélection destiné à permettre le bon déroulement dans le respect des textes applicables de la procédure de nomination de huit futurs procureurs européens, comme l'adaptation des règles de fonctionnement de ce comité ou encore les solutions à apporter aux difficultés juridiques que peut rencontrer le parcours européen dans sa coopération avec les États tiers. Nous avons tous en tête à cet égard la déclaration effectuée par la Suisse le 1er février 2022 par laquelle elle a contesté la possibilité de désigner le parquet européen comme une autorité judiciaire au sens de la Convention européenne d'entraide judiciaire du, du Conseil de l'Europe de 1959 et de ses protocoles additionnels. En cette matière, la présidence française, soutenue par l'ensemble des États membres, a proposé d'engager un dialogue bilatéral avec les autorités helvétiques pour mieux comprendre les raisons d'une telle position et envisager conjointement une solution pragmatique devant assurer le plus rapidement possible qu'une assistance judiciaire effective puisse être apportée aux investigations du parquet européen. J'ai bon espoir en ce dialogue, davantage qu'en la, qu la confrontation de principes. Mais cet anniversaire est aussi symbolique du travail accompli en à peine un an d'exercice opérationnel par le parquet européen. À l'occasion de la publication de votre premier rapport d'activité pour l'année la, pour 2021, Madame la Procureure, vous avez démontré le volontarisme du nouvel organe et vous l'avez rappelé lors de votre intervention. 
Permettez-moi de rappeler qu'au plan stratégique, c'est ainsi que le Collège s'est réuni 34 fois en 2021 et a adopté 125 décisions, notamment les Guidelines on Investigation, pourront être considérées comme une politique pénale à grande échelle, mais aussi des règles spécifiques pour les procureurs européens et les procureurs européens délégués, notamment toutes les questions de déclaration d'intérêt, code d'ontologie, règles de bonne conduite administrative. Par ailleurs, les 15 chambres permanentes supervisant l'activité des procureurs européens délégués ont tenu 282 réunions entre le mois de juin et de décembre 2021. Au plan opérationnel, au 31 décembre 2021, le parquet européen dénombrait 515 enquêtes en cours pour une fraude totale estimée à 5,4 milliards d'euros dans les enquêtes actives. À cette même date, 147,3 millions d'euros d'avoir ont été saisis et 290 mesures d'assistance entre procureurs européens délégués ont été initiées. Enfin, s'agissant des poursuites, trois cas ont fait l'objet de procédures de poursuites simplifiées et une affaire a d'ores et déjà été jugée en Slovénie. Cet anniversaire, que je disais doublement symbolique, m'a permis jusqu'à présent d'évoquer le chemin parcouru et donc d'une certaine manière le passé, mais aussi le présent par le rappel que je viens de faire de votre premier bilan. Mais un anniversaire, c'est aussi, je crois, l'occasion d'aborder le futur. Et à cet égard, permettez-moi d'évoquer deux points. Le premier, et qui doit être la boussole de toute institution publique, réside dans les attentes légitimes des citoyens européens. À l'heure où l'Union européenne fait un effort de mobilisation sans précédent sur le plan financier pour sortir de la pandémie, transformer les économies et créer des emplois au travers du plan Next Generation EU, le parquet européen aura, vous l'avez souligné, un rôle déterminant à jouer pour détecter et permettre de sanctionner efficacement le mésusage des fonds publics européens. Compte tenu des conséquences parfois très dures qu'a pu avoir la crise sanitaire sur certains de nos concitoyens, et des conséquences probablement bien plus dures encore que pourrait avoir une récession économique sur fond de guerre aux portes de l'Union, la défense des intérêts financiers de l'Union européenne revêt une importance stratégique vitale. C'est là une lourde responsabilité que je sais que le parquet européen exercera avec conscience et qu'il mobilisera pleinement. Ces exigences, les citoyens européens l'ont également à l'égard des États membres dont ils attendent légitimement une coopération loyale vis-à-vis -vis du parquet européen. Je sais tous les États membres du Conseil de l'Union européenne pleinement engagés notamment pour assurer la mise à disposition des ressources nécessaires et l'adaptation de leurs droits nationaux aux exigences découlant du règlement constitutif, dans le respect évidemment des spécificités procédurales de chacun et des traditions constitutionnelles parfois pluriséculaires des uns et des autres. Le deuxième point que je souhaitais vous parler concerne la compétence matérielle du parquet européen. Nous avons tous à l'esprit la perspective de l'extension de des compétences du parquet européen et les récents articles appelant à telle ou telle extension. Je l'ai dit ici sans aucun tabou et ce sera le sens, ce sera le sens de l'histoire. Les citoyens européens des 22 États membres ont décidé de protéger leurs intérêts financiers communs à travers la mise en place d'un ministère public spécialisé et compétent sur le territoire de l'ensemble de ces États. D'autres intérêts communs, d'autres valeurs essentielles, d'autres principes fondamentaux pourront vraisemblablement justifier un jour que ce ministère public spécialisé voit son office étendu pour en assurer également la sauvegarde. L'extension des compétences du parquet européen n'est donc pas une question abstraite, mais d'ores et déjà une question que je peux formuler sur le mode du moment, de son champ et de sa méthode. À la question du moment, j'aurais tendance à dire que la réponse s'imposera d'elle-même, une fois le parquet européen solidement installé dans le paysage institutionnel, identifié par l'ensemble des autorités répressives et judiciaires européennes et nationales, et incarné aux yeux des citoyens européens. À la question du champ, les sujets ne manquent pas, et je ne me risquerai donc pas dans des conjectures et des paris. La question de la méthode est peut-être la plus délicate. Les défis juridiques sont nombreux, de la renégociation d'un règlement constitutif dont, dont j'ai déjà pu dire combien il avait été complexe à mettre en œuvre et il a mis un temps certain à être adopté, en passant par la règle de l'unanimité ou par les, les éventuels obstacles constitutionnels dans certains États membres. La volonté politique fera beaucoup en ce domaine, dans cette matière comme dans d'autres, il faut une synergie entre les États membres, les institutions européennes et le parquet européen, un dialogue constant et de confiance. Parce que c'est ensemble que nous ferons progresser cette Europe judiciaire. C'est d'ailleurs cette Europe judiciaire que je voudrais conclure. L'échelon national est à mon sens le bon échelon d'investigation. J'observe d'ailleurs que le jugement des dossiers poursuivis par le parquet européen continue de relever les tribunaux nationaux. L'échelon européen se justifie, lui, lorsqu'il apporte une plus-value particulièrement au niveau des investigations. 
L'imbrication de plus en plus forte des deux échelons peut être source de crispation. Jusqu'où aller dans la construction du continuum judiciaire que j'évoquais Quelle place pour les spécificités nationales dans celui-ci À mon sens, la tension entre l'échelon européen et les échelons nationaux ne cessera pas, car la justice pénale est profondément un enjeu de souveraineté, mais aussi car nos systèmes sont profondément enracinés dans nos histoires nationales et nos cultures. La clé réside donc maintenant dans ce dialogue permanent que j'ai évoqué à plusieurs reprises entre les institutions européennes et les États membres, ce que je crois notre présence à tous ici illustre aujourd'hui. Je vous remercie pour votre attention. It doesn't happen very often at a conference, but today we are a bit ahead of time. There is a coffee break waiting outside the room, and we shall continue with the next panel and the round table uh, at 11.
<laughs> okay. Uh, we are going to start, please. It's the end. It's the end, so the, the final round table. Please, uh, we. So, um, first of all, and uh, as my colleagues already did yesterday, I really want uh, to, to thank and to congratulate uh, Professor uh, Kathleen Ligeti and all those helped to organize and make a great success of uh, this conference. So, uh, uh, great, great thanks, great congrat congratulations to her. Uh, this round table, uh, which I have the uh, honor not to chair, I don't want to say that, but uh, only to present. So is the final one, is titled, How to Improve the Detection of PIF Offense. I say PIF uh, as, as a French. So um, after studying yesterday the first year of action of the EPPO, and uh, setting out the challenges it faces, we will end this conference with the question that lies at the heart of its concerns because it is the condition for its success. On the front page of the EPPO website, there is this statement, I quote, nevertheless, challenges remain, the most important one being the low level of detection European Union fraud. I quote again, and the Chief Prosecutor said it before this morning, also on the, web, on the front page of the website, if there is no detection, there can be no investigation no prosecution, no judgment, and no recovery of damages. The objective is all the more important as the amount of the fraud is estimated, according to what the Chief Prosecutor have said this morning, to be at least 30 billion euros. To try to respond to this claim, of the EPPO, we will listen to four speakers. Four speakers who are in contact with the reality of fraud against the European Union financial interest. Four people whose job is precisely to work to detect this fraud. They will share with us their experience and the means they consider useful, if not necessary, to improve the PIF offense detection. These speakers are Mrs. Marie-Laure Malkles from the Mission Interministérielle de Coordination Anti-Fraude in France, Dr. Johanna Krensminska Vamvaka, who works as Director of Investigation at the OLAF. Brigadier General Paolo Borelli and Colonel Angelo Longo from the Guardia di Finanza in Italy and Dr. John Duce uh, with General, German Federal Ministry of Finance. I would like to thank them for trying to limit their speeches to about 10 minutes so that we have time to exchange with the audience. So, I will start to, to with um, Ms. Mrs. Marilor Malkles, and I uh, I I I'll let I leave and, uh, I, I'll, I give I give uh, I give to 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 uh, the, the, the speech. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, therefore, the the fight against uh, the EU's financial interest must be more effective and coordinated. And to meet this imperative, France adopted a new national strategy on February 4, 2022. 
So I will present our new national anti-fraud strategy and in particular the measure planned to improve, free, to improve PIF fraud detection. First of all, I will say a word about our organization which aims at coordinating the, fraud, the fight against fraud. International Mission of, for the Coordination of Fraud Prevention, MICAF, uh, is French AFCOS. But not only, this structure is in charge of the fight against public finance fraud in all its dimensions, tax and social security fraud, illegal employment, social security fraud, and European interest fraud. The mission copilots national anti-fraud operational groups, which have been set up around common anti-fraud issues. The aim is to encourage the decompartmentalization of approaches and better coordination between administrative and judicial actions. The national anti-fraud anti -fraud groups include representatives of the directorates and, inv and investigation departments of all the ministry concerned. Economy Finance, Social Affairs, Labour, Interior, Foreign Affairs, Social Welfare Organization, and the Judiciary. Some of these groups are related to national fraud, it is the case of resident fraud, but most working groups deal with fraud that have both a national and a European dimensions. This is particularly the case for the group devoted to the fight against VAT fraud and the fight against counterfeiting and tobacco trafficking, which was fraud robs both the national and the European budget of euro sources. But it is also the case of the national group devoted to fight against documentary and identity fraud and to the fight against ephemeral companies. Indeed, identity theft and the production of false documents are fraud that underlie all frauds, tax or social, national or European. In the same way, we find in all types of fraud ephemeral companies. These companies are used as an instrument of various fraud committed to the detriment of public finances over a short period of existence. These limited durations make it difficult to detect their criminal activities at an early stage, as the fraudulent shames are in most cases only uncovered when the company disappears. The group developed a guide on ephemeral companies to better detect and control them. As AFCOS, the International Mission Anti-Fraud Coordination Mission has developed in consultation with its partners a national anti-fraud strategy. The NAFS was adopted on February 4 this year. The NAFS covers the new significant risks in linked to the recovery and resilience facility. The National Anti-Fraud Strategy defines priorities and corresponding objectives. It is accompanied by a detailed action plan translating the objectives into actions. The objectives of the strategy constitute the roadmap in the fight against fraud for the coming years. The National Strategy is structured around three priority objectives to strengthen the effectiveness of fraud risk management. Thus, a more effective Prevention of fraud against the union budget requires a better knowledge of systematic vulner vulnerabilities as well as mechanisms and typologies of fraud. In addition, since document bases or internal controls alone are insufficient to detect fraud, a more effective to detect fraud involves strengthening the collection, sharing, and analyzing. Finally, better sanction requires enhanced cooperation between administrative and judicial authorities. First objective uh, is better knowledge for better detections. Improving fraud, pre fraud prevention requires, first of all, strengthening internal, internal control within the organization in charge of managing funds. It also requires professionalizing the agents in charge of fighting fraud through expert training. To do this, it is necessary to integrate the risk of fraud into the risk maps and the fight against fraud in the internal control procedure. Indeed, the internal control reference must acquire technical expertise in the, implement in the implementation of effective and efficient international control, fraud prevention and detection tools. The measure is to promote access to the transversal training program for internal control and anti-fraud reference to the operators in charge of the fight against 
against fraud against European interests. MECAF offers an annual catalog of cross-cutting training courses for all those all in involved in the fight against, against public finance fraud. The following training courses would be useful in the fight against fraud against a European interest. For example, in for training, initiation of false document detection, social fraud in collective proceedings, detecting short life companies, and a new formation, uh, how to work with the European Prosecutor's Office, uh, facilitated by the European Prosecutors Delegated in France. Second obje objective, detecting fraud through enhanced data collection, sharing, and exploitation. Thanks to digital companies, public bodies and administration now have access to a vast amount of data. Understanding and analyzing the data provides valuable information in the fight against fraud. Improving the detection of fraud in the EU budget is therefore now based on the collection of comprehensive and reliable data the sharing of the data on the development of analysis tool. First, collecting data. Three sorts of data have, were identified. Reporting platforms, internal, internal intelligence, and public data as. First source, reporting platforms. The data collecting on this blowing platform provides useful insight into the nature of fraud and the means by which it's committed. In this respect, whistleblowers play an important role in uncovering illegal activity or misconduct. The Court of Audit will set up a platform for the collection of reports from whistleblowers and associations fighting against breach of property. Second source, intelligent, internal intelligence. The establishment of an, an internal alert system in organization and administration to report suspected fraud contributes to better detection of fraud. All actors in the chain of, a process, of processing a file, authorizing officer or accountant, manager on the spawn controller, supervisor of the management of a public contract or, or an aid chain, are called upon to report any information that appears unusual or inconsistent. The use of this information should, it, should make it possible in the first instance to carry out rapid checks and in the second instance to draw up descriptive notes on the front pattern identified. Third sources, third exploitation of public data. The concept of public data covers all data that are or should be published or made available to the public and which are produced or collected by a state a local authority or a, a semi-public body in the context of their public service activities. Through the exploitation of this data, the aim is to improve knowledge and detection of fraud by optimizing the exploitation of this data, in particular those relating to companies and groups of companies. As highlighted in the European Parliament's report on the protection of the EU financial interest, the lack of information on the ownership structures and beneficial owners of companies and groups of companies contributes to the opacity of the current distribution of funds. From this point of view, the French Anti-Corruption Agency will continue its participation in the European Data Cross pro Project, which is a tool to detect anomaly in the capital ownerships of companies. This tool is designed to highlight ownership links between a set of companies, for example, bidders for public contract. In order to identify several risk indicators, such as collusion patterns, ownership relationships, relationship with politically exposed person or abnormally complex or offshore structure. After collecting, it's important to share data. Data is too often compartmentalized within an administration or organization information system, whether it is data provided by aid applicants or taxpayers, or data resulting from control carried out by the administration responsible for verifying expenditure and revenue. The decompartmentalization of data for the sharing of information is a necessary prerequisite 
for their enrichment in order to optimize the effectiveness of control. To facilitate, to facilitate this sharing, mechanics of cross-referencing data, unique, and unique and identification, or automatic transmission of control data will be implemented in compliance with the applicable legal frameworks. For example, uh, in order to meet uh, the challenge of combating fraud in traditional own resources on VRT in emerging economic sectors such as e-commerce, the transmission of tax on custom control data must be optimized. After collecting data, sharing data, it's important to analyze data. The Europe, uh, European Court of Auditors Special Reports recommends that member states improve detection measures by generalizing the use of data analysis tools and encouraging the use of other proactive methods of fraud detection. Two ways of analysis of analysis. The use of data tools and the use of artificial intelligence. The use of data analysis tools. First, tools provided by the European Commission. Uh, as regards expenditure, the Commission manage databases that are particularly useful in the fight against EU budget fraud, which it makes available to national partners. Arachne, a data mining tool. Odes, it is early detection and inclusion system, a list of economic operators excluded from contracts financed by the EU budget. The Commission has also committed itself in its anti fraud strategy to improving the quality and completeness of the data retrieved, as well as the analysis of the nature or method of detecting fraud. Several tools provided by the Commission are important in terms of the, law of the fight against fraud and their use will be developed. On the revenue side, the Transaction Network Analyst TNR tool which complements national risk analysis system should make it easier for tax authorities to access VAT information and thus speed up the prevention, detection and prosecution of fraud. As for the ECARIS platform, it is useful in the area of VAT fraud in the automotive sector by allowing the cross-border exchange of information on VAT permits and other information. There are also national tools on the revenue side, a great deal of data is collecting during commercial transactions, and it is particularly important to have effective data analysis tools in order to target control operations as effectively as possible. The use of artificial, of artificial intelligence uh, is also important. It can be used to analyze large volumes of data to identify anomalies and weak signals of fraudulent activity. This analysis thus contributes to improving the efficiency of fraud, the efficiency of controls by strengthening the targeting of controlled fields. In terms of, in terms of revenue, the Custom Directorate will develop new cases of use of data mining in, co in cooperation with the Public Finance Directorate in order to detect operators presenting a proven risk of fraud. The strategic objective in terms of targeting is to move from an analysis of flows to an analysis of trader profiles by using customs tax and economic data available to the administration. On the, on the expenditure side, the direction of professional training will also use artificial intelligence to, to combat fraud by developing a comprehensive collaborative data science platform that will highlight risk elements in files and thus help the European Social Fund Management Service to detect fraud. In conclusion, the goal of nation, the national French strategy is to make all organizations working together. It's the best way to improve PIF offense detection. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Malkles, for this um, very rich uh, speech. Uh, so now um, we'll uh, listen and learn about the German strategy uh, in this field. So, um, uh, Mr. Deuce, you, you have the floor. Yeah, thanks a lot. Distinguished audience. Um, yeah, 
I will, the yeah, PIF offenses comprise uh, uh, a variety of crimes. Um, I will concentrate here on the VAT fraud because um, the unit um, where I work in the Federal Ministry of Finance in Germany is competent uh, only for the VAT fraud. The fight against VAT fraud in Germany is carried out in an interaction of various administrations and federal levels, uh, which are coordinated in particular mechanisms, units, and fora. Of course, I have to mention in this context the very crucial exchange with other uh, European member states on the basis of the Regulation 904 in administrative, uh, administrative assistance, the multilateral Eurofist network for early detection of VAT fraud, and uh, with institutions like Olaf, Europol, and uh, EPO. And the collection and the control of uh, VAT by the tax offices in Germany is in the responsibility uh, of the states, the Bundesländer, and also fraud investigation and prosecution is also located by the states. On a federal level, uh, we have in Germany a federal central tax agency which carries out some central responsibilities and mainly coordination of the states. And in particular, in the field of VAT, we have a unit for such coordination, uh, which has additionally the function as a liaison uh, office for uh, coordination and legal assistance in the European context. This unit shares um, and exchanges information about cases, patterns, and trends with European partners, uh, for example, in Eurofist network and with uh, tax administrations in the States and is also the central contact in Germany for the EPPO. And as you may have guessed, um, listening to the uh, aforementioned, uh, we have as a Federal Ministry of Finance a more intense focus on uh, the prevention and detection of VAT uh, fraud, particularly as prosecution is in the responsibility of the states. In the course um, of the fight against VAT fraud um, stands at the beginning the analysis of patterns and trends in suspicious uh, constellations. There are some constant main focus goods uh, as cars, yachts and planes and main focus branches. On the other hand, modi of operandi, other goods and involved partners follow quickly changing trends which have to be detected and uh, tracked promptly. In many cases, after indication of fraud, another uh, external information is demanded for further investigation. In the world of VAT, there are many interfaces, um, like other domestic or foreign administrations and institutions, and therefore a trustful and fast exchange of information with many partners um, and the access to digital data at best uh, automatically processed is very helpful. Um, and I think the primary difficulties in the combat uh, against VAT fraud are to identify fraudulent transactions and to distinguish them from the multitude of uh, legal operations. Patterns and protagonists should be identified promptly and the necessary data has to be connected in order to assess uh, the transaction. Yeah. And now to the question how to improve the fight against VAT fraud. Uh, I start with legislative measures. Um, recently, we introduced a rule which allows the tax administration to refuse tax exemptions uh, or pre-tax allowance to subjects in cases of involvement in tax fraud. Another new rule provides the option for tax offices to restrict the VAT ID in cases of reasonable uh, suspicion of tax evasion. And looking at the legal frame conditions of VAT, one could use reverse charge mechanism more frequent in order to prevent somewhat, uh, some VAT fraud schemes from the very beginning. So the landscape in VAT processes and also the fight against uh, VAT fraud is very fragmented regarding responsibilities and data availability. It is crucial to overcome those barriers and islands of information. 
as good as possible. It is also important to bring knowledge, skills and data together from different fields like tax administration, financial intelligence and customs just to pick some and to get them into a fruitful cooperation. A number of member states decided in slightly different ways to develop IT systems which collect uh, transaction data out of electronic invoices in order to get a better databases for their analysis and also in order to track uh, transactions. The legislative proposal by the Commission, VET in a Digital Age, which is expected for the second half of 22, will probably comprise a similar system which more or less real-time reporting on e-invoice basis. And independently from that, uh, Germany aims toward a system basis on the transmission and check of e-invoices, which is agreed in the coalition agreement of the present uh, federal government. This very complex and in many respects uh, expensive project, which uh, seems to be a growing European trend, will have a huge impact on the capacities of administration and others but will also, if well executed, be very effective in the future of European fraud, fight against VAT fraud. Therefore, it must be planned and executed carefully and target-oriented. In addition to other systems like the CESOP, which includes transmission of specific payment data from financial service providers regarding cross-border uh, cross transactions, it could succeed in case uh, of good execution by all involved parties to lift the European combat against fraud up to another level. But this will not be an automatism. It will afford a good legislation, good functional coordination, and um, also regarding the specifications of the common requirements and a very good implementation. Then, this system can provide a databases which will put us in a situation to track and cross-check interactions and analyze structures, trends and patterns almost in real time and much more detailed than before. On the other hand, we should be careful with the data. It is crucial to analyze which data have to be transmitted, collected and cross-checked. Even for reasons of data protection and data economy, we should not act with a device, the more the better, and this would not only offend data protection, but can also be dysfunctional if it leads to undifferentiated and untargeted collections of data. So the classical means and methods in the fight against VAT fraud, like the Europhys network and administrative assistance, will still uh, remain important in the future. And due to the fact that this conference is partic particularly dedicated to the EPPO, I would like to highlight that our experience in cooperation with the PPO so far is very positive. Due to the delegated prosecutors in the member states, we have a good personal contact and could implement reasonable processes for cooperation. This facilitates our communication also regarding general questions and optimizes procedures. We instructed the states and their tax administration to report according to Article uh, 24, Para 1 of the EPPO regulation, um, cases with a possible damage of more than 10 million euro and, um, and uh, the relation to other member states, um, and uh, involved and established a coordination process. It is crucial to get the knowledge about EPPO and the reporting requirements to the tax offices also in Rosenheim and uh, in Flensburg, and I hope we succeeded. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dus. So uh, now we, we know more. Our German authorities plan to improve uh, detection of VAT uh, fraud. So, um, after uh, France and Germany, we uh, go on traveling by going now in Italy. <laughs> so, uh, I, I will uh, uh, 
I will uh, ask um, Brigadier General Paolo Borelli to, to present to us the Italian point of view in this field. Yes. Good morning to you, Professor, and uh, of course, good morning to everyone. Well, first of all, I would like to thank uh, for the invitation addressed to the Guardia di Finanza uh, to participate uh, to this uh, important, very important conference, uh, and I wish to congratulate the organization for the perfect uh, success of this event. Um, a special uh, thanks uh, um, to European Chief Prosecutor also to have mentioned Giovanni Falcone. Thanks. Um, well, I must, uh, um, I must start by saying uh, that, uh, alas, I don't have a good confidence with the English language, and therefore, uh, please forgive me, because I will challenge you, you with a not easy listening test. Um, well, uh, uh, coming to the topic of my speech, I would like to quickly uh, highlight how the Guardia di Finanza operates and what Guardia Finanza is. The Corps is the economic and financial police force in Italy, um, military organized and um, with a general jurisdiction um, placed directly under Ministry of Economic and Finance. Financial police means defending the national and EU budget, both on the expenditure side, fighting the conduct of new apprehension or use of public resources, and on, on, on the revenue side, through the fight against the phenomenon of evasion and tax avoidance, starting from VAT and customers' fraud. Economic police, on the other hand, means fighting the manifestation of illegality that threatened the integrity of the capital market and that of goods and services, and uh, including an att any attempt to penetrate and influence by criminal organizations. I refer to the protection of financial system from the risks of money laundering, bankruptcy, and corporate crimes and against public administration, as well as the protection of the trade markets. Furthermore, since 2017, Italian legislation has entrusted us with the role of the only police force of the sea. And in this capacity, we are committed with our air and sea assets to intercept the illicit trafficking of goods and people along the, med the, med the Mediterranean routes. And uh, these attributions, as evident, intersect some of the most important functions exercised by the European Union and uh, its institutions, and that uh, fully, fully correspond to the areas of the EPPO competence. Uh, the Corps efforts, both on expenditure and revenue side, develop through administrative interventions and judicial inquiries. The formal enables our staff to make use of powers attributed by the tax regulations and, under certain conditions, of the powers provided for by the anti-money laundering legislation. Um, as for judicial inquiries, cooperation with the judicial authorities is essential, starting, of course, from that with the European Public Prosecutor's Office. Well, corps departments always make a targeted selection, a targeted selection of the individuals that shall be investigated. This is made possible by enhancing the information that can be acquired from ordinary service activities. Well, I refer, for example, to the economic monitoring of the territory, tax activities, anti-mafia audits, anti-money laundering inspections, examination of suspicious transaction reports, and intelligence activities. And secondly, our special departments prepare risk analysis starting with the most common and significant critical issues detected during investigations, and developing the data contained in the several databases to which the corps has access. Moreover, 
they can make use of information that can be drawn from an extensive and extensive network of institutional collaborations that the Corps has in place with ministries, uh, agencies, bodies uh, that manage or monitor public spending. With most of these, the Guardia di Finanza has concluded memorandum of understanding at the central level. And then there is the network of our economic and financial experts uh, in all 25, most by located in the European countries. Um, the Corps' efforts, uh, as I mentioned, are supported by important operational IT tools, starting with the so-called operational IT. It uh, integrates some uh, 20 uh, 200 available databases, uh, um, 28 for the public expenditure sectors alone, by a single query of individuals and companies according to the one-shot input principle. Uh, the system reveals, after a few seconds, um, the relevant databases and, in many cases, the links, the links existing among every piece of information available. A doc application made by the Guardian Finanza that enabled the development of a risk analysis, such as CF anti-fraud information system and mock-up monitoring public contracts funded by the European Commission are remarkably useful. In a nutshell, both systems aim to make available aggregate and accurate information on European funding flows of interest to the territory of each unit and to carry it out um, analysis that can be used at uh, the operational level. Um, while uh, conducting an inspection activity, it's very important for the corps to analyze cash flows to know exactly where the funding and the contribution received by the companies or entities which are being investigated are actually intended to go. Um, the corps' main objective, however, including in the area of public spending, uh, lies in tackling illicit assets. This is the true aim, this is the true aim of all, all, of all of our inquiries. Um, since we are, we are aware that this is the only way to strike a decisive blow against the criminal organization involved in economic offenses. For example, uh, last year, uh, the uh, Economic and Financial Police Unit of Imperia is, uh, of course, delegated by EPPO, a 73-meter uh, luxury yacht flying the flag of Cayman Islands worth uh, eight, 85 million euros. In the last February, another example, the, the uh, Savona Guardia Finanza Group seized uh, 55 vintage uh, cars and motorbikes, and so on. Well, uh, in um, countering criminal offenses related then to the next generation EU funds, the Italian anti fraud system provides for the explicit involvement in the control system of a law enforcement force, such as the Guardia Finanza, with the general expertise as I said, in the economic and financial sector. And uh, this represents the only case at the European level in this regard. In accordance with the, govern with the governance system outlined in the national legislation, last December we signed a memorandum of understanding with the State General Accounting Office. The agreement focuses on monitoring, on monitoring the proper use of the national recovery and resilience plans resources, and, this is, and is also open to the 23 central administrations managing the investments, the majority of which have already joined. One of the most interesting aspects in, is uh, the creation by the State General Accounting Office of the so-called anti-fraud contacts network. 
that was founded for the following purposes, developing, developing analysis, assessments, monitoring and fruit risk management of the funding plan. This is a working group aimed at uh, promoting the sharing of experiences and uh, moments of discussion among its participants, the, the general accounting office, the operating administrations, and the guardian of finance. As a result of this participation, all corps operational units have been made aware of the need to report to the special departments any relevant data regarding illicit recurring phenomena. This data can be shared in the aforementioned network of anti-fraud contacts, so that, for example, the operating operations uh, or the operating administration, I, uh, I am sorry, can better adapt or modify the contents of public calls and or public notices. Another innovative feature concerns the possibility of carrying out inspections in a coordinated form involving the corps, the general accounting office, and the audit structures of the central administrations. In this context, a relevant role will be played by the register application created by the general accounting office and that will be also available to the corps. When fully operational, the system will allow out to have any useful information on the progress of the National Recovery and Resilience Plan, including the possibility of identifying each and every step in the flows of public expenditures, the actors involved, and the location of the operations. A shared cons con consideration, and I, I am about to, to conclude, project, projects will be implemented for the most part following tender procedures for the, for the execution of services or the realization of works. Therefore, the focus will uh, also be on monitoring these procedures. Practically speaking, the departments will, exami will examine the position of contractors and subcontractors with a particular focus on newly established businesses that lack financial strength or characterized by organizational business structure not suited to their commitments. The challenge ahead is uh, ambitious and at the same time essential for our countries. The Guardia di Finanza has devoted the significant resources in ensuring the necessary safeguards of legality. It's essential to encourage any exchange of experience between administrations between uh, countries. Training sector has uh, an important role. Our School of Economic and Financial Police has been for several years uh, the International Academy for Tax Crime Investigation of the OECD and the Partnership Academy of CIPOL and Frontex. Well, working as a group, uh, working as a team, as a group, is always the best answer to the most difficult challenges. We will do everything we can to continue to support the EPPO to the best of uh, our ability with uh, enthusiasm, passion and determination. The success of the EPPO celebrated today in its first anniversary gives, uh, as it's already said, an extraordinary impetus to the process of uh, European integration. Thank you for your attention. Um, maybe, Colonel Longo, you, you want to, to, uh, to add something? Okay, since, thank you very much, Professor uh, Domna Procurator. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for today. I will just try to be brief so that we don't run too much out of time. Uh, just to complement the general intervention, I will uh, just give you a um, few brief uh, uh, results of activities that have been carried on after being having been identified according to the principle that were illustrated before. 
uh, the Mulino operation, as we called, has been mentioned already by the prosecutor before, and that resulted in uh, an operation carried on by our Milan Tax and po uh, Economic and Financial Police Unit, carried on uh, under the um, directive of the Delegated Prosecutor Office of Milan, as well as the one in Germany at the Munich office. That resulted, it, it was uh, in a field uh, of uh, tax fraud in luxury car trade sector. That resulted in the seizure of 30 million euros assets that have been seized as being considered profit of tax crime. Uh, the operation were carried on together, and the Northern Upper Bavaria Police Department executed in that day, in the same day, a new, uh, new European arrest warrant against 10 suspects. So 10 people were assured to jail, and 30 million euros were funded as uh, seized as a result of uh, profit of crime. Another activity that we would like to highlight was conducted by our Palermo unit. This resulted in 36 individuals that were arrested while at the time were uh, smuggling uh, cigarettes and uh, receiving an illicit shipment of cigarettes. That resulted in 36 smugglers arrested with 20, 23 tons of cigarettes seized, 10 vessels, four fishing boats, and six, six fast motor boats, and the seizure of 170,000 euros in cash at the same time. The cigarettes, if placed on the market, uh, would have uh, yielded uh, illicit revenues of 3.5 billion euros. Last operation uh, concluded last May. Uh, resulted in a seizure of uh, uh, 8.5 million euros uh, in assets rel uh, rel uh, related to uh, VAT fraud in, in the clothing sector. A network of uh, uh, individuals were identified as being cr part of a criminal network of Chinese origin. This was carried on in Padua and resulted in uh, the uh, seizure of assets, as I said, in a worth of more than 8.5 million frauds. Uh, these are just three small examples on how we are trying to pursue our common mission in tackling illicit fraud in the benefit of our country as well as of the European Union. Thank you very much for being here today, for hosting us. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Colonel. And, and uh, when you, you, you will have time, I'm sure we'll be very interested to know the uh, examples uh, that are not small. Uh, <laughs> so now, um, um, Dr. Joanna Klevinska Vamvaka from the OLAF. So uh, uh, you have the floor, Doctor. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm very glad to, to be able to present the, the perspective of, uh, of OLAF, the, the European Anti Fraud. Uh, uh, office. Before I start, uh, I'd like to uh, congratulate Professor Rigetti and the University of Luxembourg for this excellent uh, event. It's an excellent opportunity to exchange between, uh, between uh, experts, to meet and to, um, uh, to network. Um, in my presentation, I will echo many of the points that previous speakers uh, have raised on use of IT tools. Uh, cooperation and uh, transparency. Um, so I am acutely aware that I am the last person standing on your way to lunch, so I promise not to test your patience too much. Um, many of you know our work very well. Uh, we are an uh, independent uh, investigative body carrying out administrative investigations who were created in 1999 mm -hmm. uh, for the protection of uh, uh, EU use financial interest. Uh, we detect, uh, investigate, and prevent. Um, we conduct investigations into uh, fraud and irregularities um, uh, affecting uh, EU funds, um, as well as uh, investigations concerning staff members and members of the, of the EU uh, institutions. 
Uh, as mentioned today by Commissioner uh, Reinders, the, the protection of EU financial interest is uh, more, today, probably more important than, uh, than ever. We have been reacting to crisis after crisis with the pandemic, now with the war in uh, Ukraine. The EU had to adjust uh, its policies, and it is very, very important that the EU's taxpayers' money are spent on projects that really contributes to achieving policy objectives that the EU has uh, in terms of growth, job creation, but nowadays what is very, very important is green transition, energy transition, and, uh, and digital transition uh, as well. Um, we have entered into this new relationship with, uh, with the EPO and we've been working very hard to, to establish very good uh, cooperation uh, with the EPO at operational level and uh, with, the, with, the central, uh, with the central office. That cooperation, I, I think, is working, uh, working well. We went through this first phase of identifying among the cases that we have, identifying those cases that involve uh, criminal aspects so that those cases we uh, could transfer to, to the EPO. Those were around 200. On that basis, EPO has opened uh, uh, 100 cases. And among those, we also have um, a complementary investigations where uh, while EPO has a criminal case, we in parallel have, uh, have our administrative investigation where we believe that uh, we add value um, in terms of what administratively can be done, especially for the, for the quick recovery of, uh, of funds. Uh, to just give you um, some, some statistics on our uh, activity, if we look at time between 2010 and uh, 2020, OLAF has conducted uh, 2,200, concluded 2,200 2, investigations and recommended recovery of 7.5 billion to the EU uh, budget, and we have issued uh, 3,000 uh, recommendations. Uh, judicial, financial, uh, administrative, disciplinary, and uh, uh, judicial. Of course, now with the creation of, of EPO, the judicial recommendations uh, will predominantly concern the non-participating non EPO uh, countries. If we look at yearly uh, statistics for 2020, we have concluded 230 investigations uh, issued uh, 375 recommendations and recommended recovery of almost 300 million to the, uh, to the EU budget. Um, in terms of detection, as I said, I will uh, touch upon similar points as other speakers, the use of IT tools, uh, cooperation and, and transparency. Uh, on IT tools, uh, the, the one, um, one, IT tools are about databases, platforms, collection of information, uh, reporting. Uh, one example that we have uh, in the European Anti-Fraud Office is um, a platform through which member states uh, report to us um, irregularities. Uh, that is very important in terms of expenditure. It's very important always to stress um, that the EU budget is spent in different modes, uh, mm -hmm. direct, indirect, but 80% of the EU budget is spent uh, in so-called share management, so where member states disperse the funds via paying agencies. And so the COP member, states are, member states' authorities are really at the forefront of, uh, of uh, uh, protection of EU financial interests there. And, uh, and so that cooperation between EU level and national authorities and cooperation among national authorities is absolutely, absolutely uh, uh, important in the, in the EU uh, setup. So if, if I give you a sense of what we see in terms of irregularities that are reported to us as fraudulent, fraudulent irregularities uh, by the member states, we uh, compare the last two programming periods, so 2007 to 2013, and then 2014 to 2020. Um, and then we see that detected uh, irregularities and reported as fraudulent, the trend there is stable. 
we see some improvement in uh, uh, control systems, which is a positive uh, sign. Of course, there is room uh, for improvement. Uh, we are able to see uh, what is the time gap between um, uh, uh, irregularity occurring and when it is detected. And there we see also uh, uh, some improvement between the programming periods, which is also uh, positive. But again, we of course see that there is always, uh, always room for, uh, for improvement. Um, on on uh, IT tools, uh, Marie Lor mentioned Arachne, which is a very important uh, uh, database, uh, data mining and risk scoring, uh, risk scoring uh, tool uh, in the area of uh, of expenditure. Um, it is very much recommended by us to member states that this database uh, uh, is used, and now with the amendment of the financial regulation that will be uh, discussed, uh, we also uh, um, recommend the use of, uh, of Arachne by, by member states. Uh, the, the question of, of data is something that we all agree on, I would say, that we have to use more IT tools, and, uh, but it is sometimes a little bit easier said than done. So there is the issue of developing platforms and software where data uh, can go into and that has to be properly structured. On the revenue side with customs databases, it is a little bit more structured, I would say, than it is on the, uh, on the expenditure side that we have some, some work to do and we are doing that work. Then there is the issue of uh, making sure that the database is really used, that the data goes uh, uh, into it, and uh, that the quality of the data is good, and that you need training um, uh, and quality checks uh, for, uh, for the databases. The issue is also a very important issue uh, that I wanted to add to what the other speakers mentioned, is the interoper interoperability uh, of databases. Um, there we are, for example, at Olaf, uh, certainly looking at how, from an IT point of view, we can develop software in order to pull different sets of data together. Because having access to database is just the first step. You have to have experts that know how to uh, use database know um, how to, what can be extracted from the database, know how to put different data sets together depending on what you are looking for. So having access to a database is just, just the first step. Um, you need really expertise and resources to, to be able to, to properly use to the best of your, uh, to, to your advantage the, the databases and for your uh, purposes. Um, and the interoperability is again something that requires development and a lot of skill to pull different data sets uh, together. It is something that we all intuitively think that uh, we should have and uh, that would be very beneficial for our work, but it is again something that is, it is uh, a little bit easier said than, than done and something that we need to invest uh, um, a lot of efforts uh, into. Of course, the, around the databases, there is also the legal framework, and I touched upon it. Sometimes uh, when you have instruments or, or, or uh, legal acts, they recommend use of databases. Sometimes they impose obligation to use, and there is a question of enforcement of those obligations. Apart from databases, there is the issue of electronic communication and imposing that, because that also creates yet another source of data. Um, so this digitalization uh, is, is, uh, is also entering the legal sphere in terms of legal recommendations or obligations to, uh, to create digital data and, and then collect it and, and, and use it. But I, I, I wanted to echo the point made by John that we also have to find a balance because we cannot just collect all possible data and make it available to, uh, th there has to be a balance because of, for, for all practical reasons, because we, what we can manage, 
and also we have to have in mind data protection and uh, um, and those, those those considerations and a good balance there. So that's on the databases. On cooperation, again, I will echo uh, previous uh, speakers. The uh, what we call the EU anti-fraud architecture is is very complex, multi-layered, many partners. So it is absolutely important that there is a good cooperation, uh, good cooperation be between all of us. Um, that cooperation, uh, we've been working on creating this on, uh, on uh, cooperation with the EPO at operational level on cases. Um, we have cooperation between us, so the EU level, and that applies also to EPO and national administrations, are very, very important, national administrations, that they are part, that, that, that because it's a vast network to, to, to have them on board and uh, to have a good cooperation between the EU level and national administrations. The, we have AFCOSIS mentioned also by Marie, by, uh, Marie Law, where we have very good cooperation with, with national, uh, national services. We might have sometimes a very sort of targeted uh, cooperation. Um, as an example, I can mention the Operation Sentinel, which is coordinated by, by Europol and involves uh, the EPO, us, and uh, member states, and is targeted to establish cooperation and operational cooperation on, uh, on the uh, next generation EU, the resilience and uh, recovery. Uh, facility where we are very early on, but we are trying to work very. Um, we are trying to work with national administrations on the prevention side, and the prevention side goes hand in hand with detection because, based on your past experience, you identify risks, and as you look at the risks, you are getting better at uh, detection. So for recovery, resilience and recovery facility for RRF, it, is, it will be very, very important also to work hand in hand with, uh, with member states because this a huge amount of, of money that ha will have to be spent in a very short uh, period of time. Um, and then the last point uh, would be on uh, transparency, disclosing information about where the EU funds, uh, where EU funds go, um, uh, and that, of course, from the EU side, is very much about uh, showcasing of what are the benefits of uh, of EU funds. But it is also uh, uh, subjects EU funds to public scrutiny, and then that transparency leads to can potentially lead to better detection because there is there is greater public scrutiny over uh, over funds so um, that were basically the, the three main points and i'm very glad that uh, uh, those points seem to be the same for for national administrations uh, as well on on it tools uh, cooperation and, and transparency thank you Thank you. Thank you, uh, Doctor. On, um, on the program, it is uh, lunch time now, <laughs> so uh, I, I don't know if uh, I have to end the roundtable uh, and so the conference also, or if it's, it's possible to have some questions from the audience. We have time for that? Okay, so uh, we see if the audience is, is if somebody in the audience uh, wants to to ask a question to our distinguished speakers, uh, so uh, we are waiting for uh, for our uh, for your questions. It is lunch time. <laughs> I think it's ready lunchtime. <laughs> so, so no, no questions. So uh, I, I think we, we so uh, I will end this uh, this uh, roundtable and the and the conference. And uh, I will uh, uh, again uh, thank um, Professor Cataline uh, Ligeti, Université du Luxembourg, and uh, everybody. Uh, I think it was a, a great success and. Uh, 
thank, thank, you very, thank you very much. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, indeed we are closing and coming to the end of three days, very, very rich discussions on the first anniversary and operations of the EPPO. We have received, I think, a lot of inspiration. Yesterday, Professor John Fefale compared the EPPO by using the metaphor of the European Convention of Human Rights being a living instrument, the EPPO being a living body in a EPPO zone. So we are looking forward to continue our discussions and I would like to thank to the Chief European Prosecutor, Madame Corduta Kovesi, for having suggested the University of Luxembourg as the alma mater of the EPPO. We are certainly very happy in uh, continuing this cooperation and organizing more fruitful discussions and events as the EPPO evolves. Thank you very much for your uh, participation and with this I officially close the public part uh, of this event. Uh, the EPPO is still holding a closed uh, event at two o'clock and those who have received invitation to that event, the event will take place here. Thank you very much.